Well, greetings, everybody, and welcome to Shepherd's Voice. I want to extend Holy Day regards to everyone on this, the Day of Atonement. You know, growing up in the church, uh, I saw a number of different approaches to preparing for this day and even some traditions that uh, came about as the day drew, drew to a close. Uh, stands to reason, I suppose, because of the nature of the day that uh, involves fasting, where we don't eat between sunset uh, last night and sunset uh, this evening. I think back to uh, one fellow who would never brush his teeth that day, and, uh, just in case a little trickle of water went down his, his throat, and others, including myself and my dad, who would uh, kind of curtail our coffee intake over the preceding couple of days uh, so that uh, uh, the Day of Atonement didn't have, you know, a, a headache that went along with it due to no caffeine. Um, and sometimes this stuff went on for nearly a, a week prior. And uh, others, you know, again, like myself, uh, would load up on a fair amount of water the, the day before. And... I have had to kind of recalibrate how I think about uh, this day, uh, looking back on those things. You know, Jim was talking about the futility of some of these church-wide fasts uh, uh, that have been called historically. And I remember, uh, again, growing up in the church and um, coming back to the church in my 20s, that this, this happened periodically. And I always did wonder about whether or not God would actually honor such things and you know it got me to thinking again one of Jim's messages kind of set the table for one of mine um, you know we have to be really careful that we don't enter into this whole fasting thing in, in a futile manner either so that's something that we'll address a little bit today um, you know I had a friend also back then who would wait an entire digestive cycle uh, he would stop eating after, you know, an entire digestive cycle ahead of sunset so that there was no chance of anything being in his belly uh, when atonement started. And it just makes me wonder, you know, were these things actually necessary? And, you know, I think we probably know, probably not. Uh, but we'll get into a few, few things like that. But... Another thing that we'll kind of look at today is this kind of an example. I, I, I had a friend uh, out on the West Coast who knew an observant Jewish fellow who yet used to say, uh, uh, atonement may be a feast, but it's no mitzvah, you know, and I always wonder kind of what he meant by that, but it was, uh, it was no mitzvah uh, to him because of the no eating, you know, and so it seemed kind of accurate I suppose and it's a little bit unpleasant but but and here he goes again with the but um, looking back it seems that a lot of emphasis was placed on these kinds of things and these descriptions uh, of the day and a lot of emphasis was placed on uh, preparing for the unpleasantness uh, of the day and how kind of less than fun it can be for, for a lot of people. So uh, I'll say this right at the start. I, I took part in earnest, uh, I might add. So I'm throwing myself under the bus here uh, as well. Um, but as for the day not being a mitzvah, I'm, I'm going to challenge that today. You know, a mitzvah, it implies a celebration and a good thing, something good that's happening uh, uh, to you and uh, for this day to not be a mitzvah I think is actually a bit of a stretch and we'll 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 look at that today um, because I'll ask is today really not a feast as we've come to understand feasts historically uh, rarely do you see uh, the day of atonement listed as a feast of atonement um, I say rarely because on occasion it does happen with some groups and ministries they do, but it's, it, it is not the norm, I'll say that uh, going forward. Um, but that said, I guess a better, more direct question would be, why do we, in the 21st century, faithful believers in Christ, why do we fast on atonement? Why do we fast today? Should we treat ato uh, atonement, as some do, as a fast at any cost, no wiggle room? Uh, you have no faith if you don't fast today, and, and that it's a complete wreck of a failure 
if you say uh, are diabetic or have some other condition where you have to take some medication today and obviously you know you'd have to take some water some food or whatever the you know a lot of people have put a lot of undue burden on folks that come into today already afflicted and uh, I'd say that that's something that we want to steer clear of is that kind of judgment on others brother and we really want to take today as a a uh, personal day to to look inward, to be introspective, and, and seek the will of Jesus Christ as we move forward. So I've had people try to convince me that those who would break the fast early due to health concerns, you know, like I said, like diabetes or whatever, whatever concern it is, uh, I say that because it's in my family and so forth, and I myself, I, I suffer from uh, low blood pressure. Uh, and I have historically made myself quite sick on this day. And... I don't know if that's necessarily what's required of us. Um, but people used to really get judgmental over those who would take medications and, and accuse them of being lacking in faith. And even to the end of saying that they're not truly converted. If they were, they would do it anyway, even if it killed them. Um, and I guess you might, if you know me at all, you might know that I don't necessarily subscribe to the, that point of view. I don't think this is a day of uh, uh, our judgment. Let's put it that way. This is a day that has to do with God's judgment and uh, reconciliation of ourselves to him. And that's going to be a key word that we're going to look at a little bit as we go forward as well. So uh, some of those on the extreme fringe uh, of thinking believe that if one doesn't stop eating that one full digestive cycle, uh, that is, if you have uh, food still in your gut, uh, that there's no way that you could possibly feel the full effect of, of today or have any understanding of it. Um, and therefore, you may have spent the entire day in contravention uh, of God and just, you're a wretch now and that's it for you, done. You know, and I'm, uh, brother, and I'm, I'm just not going to uh, go down that road with, with anybody, um, not, not with anybody at all. So, so let's get something straight away off the table. I'm not saying don't fast. I am not saying that fasting is not a key component of today. Nothing of the sort, okay? So let's get that off the table. I'm not going to tell you you shouldn't fast. I won't because that in itself would be bogus information and bad preaching. And we don't want to do that. It's not scriptural and we can't have that type of extreme thinking uh, and or teaching. And I won't engage myself in that. So I'm not telling you don't fast today. Definitely fast this is a this is a day of fasting for sure but i want us to have things in the proper perspective um i will often come out here and ask you to consider some of our beliefs and our behaviors but the abrogation of the sabbath and the holy days and what goes into them i won't do that brethren that's something that i won't do so how and why do we do what we do you know, I believe is something that we ought to look at. I, I think that there's always uh, some discussion to be had as to why we are doing what we do. Uh, we're supposed to become mature in Jesus Christ, so it's a good thing to look into these things. So I think that if we do that, that we'll find that today actually is a feast. Today actually is a feast, and that we may have overlooked uh, what the mechanism of fasting is supposed to produce. Okay, and hopefully we'll see that by the time I wind this up today. Uh, many have written reams about how fasting is, is really good for us. And uh, this, even this, you know, one day of the year where it's, you know, pretty much a foregone conclusion that we're going to fast. And, you know, brethren, that, that may be the case, but it would seem to me that a Sabbath day such, of this, such as this that doesn't involve the eating of food is a Sabbath to look closely at because it is a little bit different, okay? And that's, that's, that's okay. Um, and it is in, somewhat, uh, in some way a enhanced or an amplified Sabbath because of it. And we're gonna start heading down that road. 
Uh, you see, there's all, uh, the weekly Sabbath, often dubbed as uh, the regular weekly Sabbath. I don't know what's so regular about it. I think it's a pretty special day, but uh, just for the term, uh, there's the regular weekly Sabbath, and then there are the holy days, which are to, be, to heighten our awareness of Jesus Christ uh, and to key in on certain principles, you know, and not the least of which, a day like today, the picture is Christ's immutable power to lay hold of Satan and put him away. And that's a, that is definitely part of today. But what is it about today? Is it a day that is merely to be survived while we cheer on the putting away of Satan? Is that what it's about? Um, with these and some other questions that we may get to, let's see if we can't figure out a little bit about how and why we do what we do on the Day of Atonement. And God willing, we can come away encouraged. I want us to come away encouraged, brethren, by what we come up with. So, what is this day's uh, significance in God's master plan for salvation? What are some of those principles? I've often noted how some of the observances uh, that we adhere to are bookended. And the Passover season, and in particular the Lord's Supper, and the pursuant you know, Day of Atonement that we've arrived at now, instruct us through topics such as forgiveness of sin and repentance and uh, Christ's sacrifice. The big difference, however, though, brethren, is that the Lord's Supper uh, it, it deals with redemption. It deals with redemption. Christ took on the, that penal phase of what would have been our penalty the, of death. He took that on. And we'll see in one of the scriptures that we go to here in a moment uh, how he did that so that he could take first place in, in, in everything. Um, but atonement, reconciliation is the focus. Uh, reconciliation is the focus. God has given us something to do that he wants. And these things can either happen by force or by will. And in Satan's case, it's pretty much happening by force. He's forcing the, uh, his acknowledgement of his part in the deception of mankind and the, the, the ruining of the aspects of God's creation that, that, he want, that God wanted to implement and that Satan has become this stumbling block uh, against. And he's going to have to willfully, or no, uh, less than willfully even, by force, uh, be made responsible and answer for what he has done and what his part in this is. But for reconciliation to happen, it means that two parties have to come together and the reconciliation part happens when the offending party realizes their personal part and responsibility and culpability in it. And Jesus Christ has paid that penalty for us and God has given us this day that has this fasting implication on it to to cleanse ourselves and, and remove uh, all other means of relying on anything other than him from ourselves on this day. Uh, and so it's a much different day, but they are bookends of kind of the same mindset and the same lesson. Uh, and it's an integral part of God's uh, overall plan. But definitely today, uh, reconciliation is part of the focus. So, in other words, the Day of Atonement picture is the essential next step in uh, God's plan that divinely complements the symbolism that is there in the Lord's Supper and the Passover season. All of us, brethren, suffer from sin. And Romans 3, 22 and 23 indicate that sin affects us all. It says all have sin and fall short of the glory of god fall current present tense we all fall short and we got to keep that in mind uh i'll let you read those scriptures on your own but th this the sin situation though it it has many avenues by uh which it'll affect each one of us as an individual and certainly we can't deal with a day like today without taking note of the putting away of Satan. Okay, that is a component for today. I don't want to overlook it. It's just not going to be our main focus uh, for today. Uh, but scripturally, it is 
definitely a theme of today. In Revelation, Revelation 12, verse 9, reads, and if you'll turn there, it says, So the great dragon was thrown out, the ancient serpent who is called the devil and Satan, the one who deceives the whole world. He was thrown to earth and his angels with him. Uh, now, in the time frame that this scripture is referring to, as John is telling this, uh, there is a constant, and that is the one called the devil and Satan and his angelic followers. Uh, then when we go over to Revelation 20, and we'll read verses 1 to 3. It's Revelation 20, verses 1 to 3, and this talks about where Satan is bound. And in verse 1 it says, Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, holding the key to the abyss, and a great chain in his hand. In verse 2, he seized the dragon, that ancient serpent, who is the devil, and Satan and bound him for a thousand years. He threw him into the abyss, and he closed it, and he put a seal on it, so that he would no longer deceive the nations until the thousand years was completed. And after that, he must be released for a short time and that's uh, something that'll be thematic towards the uh, end of the feast this year you know as we get head towards that last day um, in the time frame though that this scripture is referring to there is the same constant that ancient one called the devil and satan and here we have one of the real thematic thrusts for today and that is the binding of satan for the period of time wherein jesus christ claims the influence over his creation okay and there is no more satanic influence for that period of time and that period of time is what's coming up next in the feast of tabernacles albeit we'll be observing it a little bit differently this year um but that is the time that uh, that pictures and that begins ne next uh, week falls out on the weekly sabbath this this year the beginning and the end of the feast um now this relates to our fasting today in a way, and hopefully you'll bear with me as we get to that. And that fasting is a means of heightening our reliance on Jesus Christ. Um, it, it's this submission that James speaks about in James 4 and verses 7 through 8. And if you want to turn there with me, we can have a quick look at that. Uh, because James says, therefore submit to God, Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. Um, so this heightened awareness of our need for Jesus Christ is all over this particular passage. And it's only two verses, two short verses at that, but it, the, this need for Jesus Christ is all over the passage. Uh, here we see a couple of things happening. Uh, that relate in particular. Uh, now, v verse 8, with the draw near to God and he will draw near to you, is used with reference to fasting almost exclusively when we study our Bibles or we listen to certain messages, and especially on this per day in particular. Um, I'm not 100% sure that that verse is exclusively about fasting. However, it does apply. It does point to something very important. And that is our personal responsibility and culpability for our sinful state. We have a part to play. Although Satan, you know, is the deceiver, we as mankind got on board pretty readily. So, there are some things that are notable in this passage. I want us to have just a quick look at it. Submission to God is the means of resisting the devil. Okay? And... Of course, we know that if that is indeed the case, the devil bails. He gets out of there. He's not, he's not in for the fight. Now, this translates to a relationship wherein we move closer to God, and he, in turn, is motivated to respond to us. But it comes from that reliance on him and the submission to him. Because we have to get the devil out of there first. So if we submit to God, the devil bails out, and then this relationship of coming together closer to God is actually able to take root. Uh, as Jim pointed out in the most recent SVM message uh, on the Sabbath, just a couple days ago, uh, this is what motivates God to interact with us in all hope and express his mercy, is that faith in Jesus Christ and the belief in him and the plan that he has set forward and the acceptance of what his will is. 
And what he does promise is that if we seek that will and we want to get on board with him and our heart is truly in it, that he will respond in kind for the furtherance of his plan, directive, and will. It's really kind of that, that, that easy. Um, let's note, though, that at the end of verse 8, uh, how James is speaking to their current state. Again, we currently fall. We fall short. And he was talking to their current state as sinners and double-minded people and how there needs to be cleansing. There needs to be cleansing, and that's that reconciliation part. And we've discussed in past messages uh, here on SVM how Satan is instrumental in everybody's life by acting in different ways. He appeals to us on different levels of our different personalities and so forth. And it's typically either by direct influence, and we see that, and we have examples of that, or by Becoming a sideline supporter of our proclivity to err on the side of human nature uh, and, and working with our vain state. And he knows that's there. He's been around for a long time. That's why it's noted that he is from, from the old. He's old. He's ancient. Uh, he's been around for a while, and he's got lots of experience in knocking off uh, human beings and he's particularly good at knocking off people in the church and it's really really sad so anyway with that in mind turn with me if you will let's go back to the book because we want more of the apostolic uh, writings here and what they say on the matter uh, so go with me now if you would to 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and we'll begin in verse 14 and it says that this comes by by no surprise because it says and no wonder for satan disguises himself as an angel of light and this is one of those ways that he has that direct influence with us sometimes uh, and appeals to our vain senses uh, verse 15 so it is no great surprise that, uh, that his servants his servants also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness the proverbial wolves in sheep's clothing and has kind of a spoiler alert you know ending on that on verse 15 there it says their end will be according to their work so there this definitely has something to do with what we choose to put ourselves behind as well brethren uh this is a big part of it uh we've also discussed recently that uh many of the issues of sin are not just in the world outside our holy gates here whoa what would be considered something you know out side of the body of Christ, but rather, brethren, within it uh, at a church-wide level. And that actually is indeed the case. Okay, So there is a need for us to look inward, but the scripture points to those who come out, uh, who come to you as servants uh, of righteousness. They may well be, uh, as Jim put it very eloquently here, you know, uh, Satan's uh, useful idiots and will therefore need to be resisted. They need to be resisted. Uh, and James 4 points that out. But again, I'll emphasize that for that, we need to look inward. We need to look inward on a personal level because today we deal with the absence of food and all that goes into the Day of Atonement on an individual basis. Uh, while today it does have reference to the cleansed body, that being the church uh, that, that Jesus Christ returns to, uh, the church is, after all, made up of individuals who have come to that cleansing. So we as individuals have to take responsibility for both the good and the bad parts. That's, that's just part of being a Christian. And uh, that change of heart and mind, is, that translates to a literal changed state of being. It's, it's actually amazing how that takes place. So we can hopefully agree that this day definitely has a focus um, on the removal and the suspension, if you will, of Satan in, that, in the first step of his answering for the deception uh, that he has caused. However, as I said, I want us to look at the personal aspect of the day and how that relates to our fasting. Um, that is, as we noted moments ago, our personal culpability and our personal responsibility for how we have all responded to our human nature and to Satan's influence. Because 
as I was throwing myself under the bus earlier. The, that bus has got lots of room under it. We all have to be there. We're all under the bus. Um, so moving forward, and uh, there are some scriptures that I'll let you read on your own, okay? And it's uh, Romans 1 to 18, and if you can read that clear through to Romans 3 and verse 20, uh, Paul, as I said, we're looking for the apostolic writings here about Jesus Christ and how the New Testament church is to perceive things. Paul drives home the point that all people, whether pagan or the pagan Gentile or the uber religious Jew, uh, we're all under sin. Okay, we just read that there. We said that we've all come uh, short of the glory of God. Um, and he zeroed in in these particular passages, again, that's Romans 1, uh, verses 18, and through to chapter 3 and verse 20. Um, he zeroed in on the religious Jews for their self-righteousness, okay, and the Gentile for their forms of idolatry. And he was talking to both of them because that church at Rome was comprised of both the, the traditional Jewish people and the uh, reasonably new uh, Gentile followers of Christ and believers in Christ. Um, the Jewish component uh, of the church at Rome believed that salvation, they just couldn't get their head around salvation not being attained by some work of the law and strict adherence to the law and everything being very judgmental. There was a real physical aspect to that. Uh, but the newer Gentile component, of course, they were still dealing with their issues of morality and, and idol worship and further on in Romans 9 and, and again you don't have to turn there but you can read it yourself uh, we're told that Israel couldn't and didn't attain the righteousness of the law for a very specific reason okay and speaking about Israel it, it, in particular in verse 31 of Romans 9 if you're there go ahead read it with me if not I'll read it for you and you can check this stuff out later on your own Romans 9 31 uh, says, but Israel, pursuing the law for, uh, for righteousness, has not achieved righteousness of the law. Why is that? Because they, Israel, because they did not pursue it by faith, but as if it were by works. They stumbled over the stumbling stone. Verse 33 says, as it is written, look, I am putting a stone in Zion to stumble over and a rock to trip over. Yet the one who believes on him, that is Jesus Christ, brethren, will not be put to shame. Will not be put to shame. So he was teaching them that they had to go in an opposite direction from where their heads were at. And the point wasn't to say that only Jews or Gentiles can or will sin in these distinct manners. Uh, but rather to highlight everyone's need, everyone's need, brethren, to come to Jesus Christ and to reject past notions, traditions, and teachings that skew us away uh, from that elevated center, the elevated center that is Jesus Christ. Paul is saying that if salvation was dependent upon works, then we face an impossible barrier too high of a climb, brethren. And that is the righteousness and glory of God. So then the question becomes, how can we who have sinned then be reconciled to the righteous God of all glory and ultimately be in his holy presence? How can we do that? Well, brethren, the answer is, be right with God through faith in his son, Jesus Christ. Your Messiah, my Messiah, the Savior, brethren, and his gracious sacrifice. So what I'm saying is, is that even if we don't have our, uh, that if we don't have our focus on Jesus Christ, if our focus is not there, and if we have our minds and our hearts set, don't have them set on truly serving the Father, then fasting on a personal level no matter how accurate of time frame or when or it becomes ineffectual and futile as futile as the national days of prayer and fasting and so forth that Jim was talking about on the last Sabbath so with that let's take just a quick jump back to Leviticus 23 and let's look at what's what's written there and we'll begin with verse 27 
Uh, let's begin in verse 27. Yeah, it says, on the 10th day of this seventh month, of course, it's talking about the sacred calendar. The uh, seventh month is the day of atonement. Yom Kippur, uh, you are to hold a sacred assembly and practice self-denial. And here's the part that often doesn't get read. And you are to present a food offering to the Lord. That's pretty interesting. We'll get to that just uh, momentarily here. Uh, but note the self-denial. The self-denial. This is in reference to not eating or preparing food for the period of this particular Sabbath. But I want us to note that these folks back then, Israel back in Leviticus, was supposed to present a food offering to God on a day where we don't, or where they didn't, take food. And we kind of mirror that. Now, we don't do that sacrifice part, because we've already discussed that. Jesus Christ is that sacrifice. And he took that part away. So that part's already been done. So what's left is still this thing that we've been left with. We've spoken before about how in every transactional discourse with God, uh, he must benefit first and foremost from it. So this self-denial, in Israel's case, was partnered with a physical food sacrifice given to God. So let's drop down to uh, verse 29, where then it says, if any person doesn't practice self-denial on this particular day, he needs to be cut off from his people. And this is the part where God tells them, you know, that what has to happen in the event of failure or rejection. And it doesn't seem to be a lot of wiggle room there, but we're going to see here in a second why. There was only a covering for, for sin back then. There was no removal of sin. There was just a covering for it. And so the Day of Atonement had a particular significance in the yearly calendar of, of these folks. And it's really good that we go back and we have a look at this. Uh, verse 32 then says, It'll be a Sabbath of complete rest for you, and you must practice self-denial. You are to observe your Sabbath uh, from the evening of the ninth day until the following evening. Uh, so here we have the time frame for the event itself summarized. And again, we can note that there's a lot of emphasis on the physical here. And there's a reason for that. Back then, they didn't have one key element. And that's something that we do have, brethren. So I told you we were going to look at some verses in Colossians there last time we spoke. Uh, and this is about the centrality of Christ. And that's exactly where we're going to go to right now. Colossians 1. And we're going to begin in verse 14. In him we have redemption starts off with talking about redemption, the forgiveness of sins. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all of creation. For everything was created by him in heaven and on earth, the visible and the invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him, and I love this part, for him, for him. Verse 17, he is before all things, and by him all things hold together. Love that part too, because that should really begin to crystallize for us who Jesus Christ is and is to be in our lives. And this is why I said he is the elevated center where we need to be looking. For God was pleased to have all all his fullness dwell in him. And through him to, now we come to what today is about, reconcile everything to himself. Reconcile everything to himself, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood that was shed on the cross. See, back in Leviticus and on through the Old Testament, there were isolated incidences of people who, through divine help and revelation, were able to look forward to the coming Messiah. And they had faith in the fact that he was coming. However, generally speaking, the part that was in this period was this sacrifice of Jesus Christ and the, uh, the redemption and the reconciliation that comes through him. So these sacrifices were indeed replaced by the blood of Christ. They were replaced by the blood of Christ. And verse 20 indicates that this is how God makes peace 
and reconciles us along with everything else to himself. Brethren, that actually makes today a mitzvah. That makes today a feast. And that is the elevated center that I was talking about a moment ago. And that's the title of today's message, actually, is the elevated center. God has instructed us to fast today because it's what he has determined to be sufficient for us to endure on this ongoing yearly basis with respect to this holy day and what he wants us to be focusing on today. This is how he wants the relationship to take place. We can't add to it by fasting extra time. I mean, what are we going to do? Can we invent anything that is going to bring us up to the same level of suffering that Jesus Christ endured on our behalf? That's a resounding no, brethren. Not likely. So even if we fail today, guess what? If our hearts and our minds are in the correct spot, in terms of our faith, if our faith is in check, then that blood sacrifice is, for there, is there for that too. It's there for that too. Therefore, it's not a good idea to not take your medication today. Do silly things like that, brethren. Today is about our faith being tested somewhat. Not, and never is, about testing God to see if he'll deliver uh, us from danger, especially danger we put ourselves in. That's not what the theme of today is. And I don't believe that's ever the theme, is to test God in that way. For folks uh, being in a position of being afflicted prior to the beginning of atonement, please, use caution. Use caution and let your faith guide your actions today, brethren. This is a perfect time, as most of this time has been recently, to, to focus in on our faith, especially since the whole pandemic and the lockdowns and so forth that we keep having to reference. But this has been a wonderful time for us to investigate and to key in on the aspects of our faith. And this day is no different. The fasting, the affliction, the denial, this will all come to an end. This will all come to an end. And it's my belief that it's partly because God wants us to have a cleansed palate. A cleansed palate before entering into this Satan-free environment as we look towards the millennial phase of God's plan. He wants us to have a cleansed palate. And so the fasting itself is supposed to be a reflection of our submission and reliance upon the faith we have in Jesus Christ, brethren. Not a physical work that is to cajole God into some sort of action or specifically move him in some way that, uh, for those reasons. In fact, throughout biblical history, you know, we'll see that God has given many instructions and commands and so forth uh, to people knowing full well that they were likely going to fail. But that doesn't mean that we're not supposed to try, and that doesn't mean that we're not supposed to work towards it. But that goes all the way back to the garden, and I'm reminded about the fruit of two trees. And... That instruction was given, and it was failed. And it had consequences, and it has consequences. And we're living within those consequences today, brethren. But God is aware that some may stumble today, and he's aware that some will, will be a success. And as I've said, I'm in no way encouraging people not to fast today. Not at all. Indeed, fast. But let's keep things in their proper perspective. You see, either way... The question remains, where do, we where do we turn in times of hardship and in times of plenty? If today is a bit of hardship, we have the feast coming up, that's usually looked at as a time of plenty. If we are granted plenty, brethren, then we need to humbly come to God with thanks for guiding and sustaining us. And bringing us to that place in, in, inside of his will and his wisdom. But when we fail, 
stumble, stumble or otherwise endure hardship and sin. Well, the same thing is true, brother. The same thing is true. We need to be thankful for the trials as much as we are for the blessings. They are both actually blessings. You see, he reconciled us and will be at peace with us through the only one able to bring that into reality. And that was through the shed blood of his son, Jesus Christ. And that, my friends, in spite of our empty stomachs and thirst, it makes this a feast. It makes this a feast. Centered on Jesus Christ, like the rest of the holy days are, brethren, they all point to Christ. They all point to Christ. So, brethren, happy Feast of Atonement. May we grow ever closer at, to being at one. That part of that, at one -ment, that is what today is. May we grow ever closer to being at one with Jesus Christ and God the Father. And with that, I'll close with a reminder to, as always, hit the bell, give us the thumbs up, and tell a friend. And, brethren, we'll catch you next time on Shepherd's Voice magazine.